Hi everybody, it's Dr. Eric Corum, founder of AIM7. Welcome back to The Blueprint, where we distill cutting edge science, leadership, and life skills into simple tactics optimized for your busy lifestyle and goals. Developing grit and resilience has never been more crucial for thriving than these turbulent times. So how do Navy SEALs cultivate rock solid mental toughness, even under extreme adversity? How do they build resilience to keep moving forward under difficulty. Well, today we have retired Navy SEAL Commander Mark Devine, one of the world's top experts on forging elite teams and unbeatable minds with us today. With over 20 years of equipping SEALs, Fortune 500 CEOs, and Olympic athletes, Mark reveals the specific daily practices for training your nervous system and mindset. By optimizing physical health, mastering your physiology, and turning obstacles into growth opportunities. You'll learn to embrace challenges and accelerate your performance. I want to give you a quick heads up that I had some audio issues on my end. Mark's audio is absolutely amazing, so you won't miss a thing. The episode is fantastic, but I just wanted to let you know. So let's get right to it. Let's lean in and learn from the best. Mark, you've spoken extensively about developing resilience through your career in the military. You've also, you know, experienced this in unbeatable minds. I mean, you've been at this for a very long period of time and equipping others. Can you share some specific strategies or practices that people can put in their daily lives to build resilience, specifically when they're facing high pressure situations or maybe changes that come along in life that they're not expecting? Mm Mm-hmm. And imagine that, like that never happens, does it? No. (laughs) (laughs) Really? (laughs) First, like, let's talk about that word resiliency, right? I I love language just like you. And so often people come across a word and resilience is one of them where we just assume we know what it means. But I bet you, you ask 10 people, you get 10 different answers on what it is. So from my perspective, resiliency It's different than, let's say, physical and mental toughness because it speaks to the long haul. Whereas like when you think of someone, hey, are you mentally tough? It's like, yeah, I can get through something. I can tough it out. I'm strong enough to really deal with anything as it happens right here, right now. Resiliency is mental toughness and emotional resolve displayed over and over and over again through the course of one's lifetime. And furthermore, when the obstacles come... As you and I know, they every listener knows, they come fast and furious. In fact, the more, the more rapidly you grow, the more rapidly the obstacles come. You get tested more. And so resiliency is embracing the suck of the obstacles and actually looking forward to them, bringing them closer to you by not avoiding them. The SEALs would say, we run toward the sound of gunfire. Why do we do that? Because that's where the lessons are. That's where the learning is. That's where the growth is. And that's how you can accelerate yourself in life at all areas, learning and growth. So to me, resiliency is that long-term ability to radically and rapidly overcome obstacles and develop an accelerated growth and mindset as a result of that. So every time you hit an obstacle, you come out the other side, not only having survived it, but we've got a smile on your face because you've learned and grown and you're racing toward the next obstacle. If I were to reduce this to a platitude or a saying, I would think about my Zen master who in one of our, after one of our Zen sits on a Thursday night, you know, he would do these little chalkboard talks. One of them, he wrote the kanji characters. And this is kind of funny. He said, fall down seven times, get up eight. And, you know, he was talking about resiliency. And it, it wasn't until years later that someone said, that doesn't add up the math, right? If you, if <laughs> right. you fall down seven times, you get up seven times. And I'm like, that's true. Unless you start down, I guess. But anyways, the idea was solid, right? The idea is like when you fall down, you get up and you not just get up, he said, but you get up and you learn from the experience and then you go forward so that you don't have the same experience next time the obstacle comes, right? Resiliency is the ability to navigate life's complexity and challenges with grace. So how do we get there, right? Back to like tactics and tools. There's nobody on this earth who can be resilient without physical health and strength, right? The times that we feel most unresilient is when we are broken, injured, uh, sick, 
or generally just in a bad position. And so I like to start there and say, you want to develop some serious resiliency, get your body healthy. And it's not that hard, right? It's a pretty simple thing, right? It's something you teach and there's millions of people out there saying, get your body healthy, move your body every day, drink lots of water, get lots of sleep, eat really good food, spend time in nature and do it with a community of people who are positive and courageous and that you actually like. That's the simplest formula for a healthy body, which is going to lead to a healthy brain, which is going to lead to a healthy mind. So resiliency always starts with physical health. I could go on and on, but that's probably the first strategy for resiliency is get the body healthy and discipline yourself to make that a daily practice. I like Not that. something you do just around the first of the year with the New Year's resolutions that fall off after 30 days. Fitness and health are daily practice. I'm with you. I'm trying to think of when I've been the weakest mentally, and it's typically when I feel broken. That's right. Yeah. Now, along with that, it's not realistic to think that having a daily practice of fitness and health with those six things that I just described, you know, movement, exercise, nutrition, sleep, whatever, time in nature, because life happens. My wife says life is lifey <laughs> and shit will happen and you will have an injury. Something will happen, right? Mm -hmm. You might get COVID again or whatever the next thing is. So resiliency is also an attitude of when you're not at your optimal physical place, you don't lose your mind. You can remain positive and courageous in spite of that limitation and work through it and around it. Now, my example for that is I was a CrossFitter like you for a while. And I actually was, I never injured myself. I maybe I broke my ankle running, not broke, but I, I severely sprained my ankle running once, but that's like the only injury I had. I got all the way through SEAL training, through 20 years of SEAL commander, never injured myself. Crazy. But then comes CrossFit, right? <laughs> <laughs> I want to make some comments about that. The reason orthopedic surgeons exist, right? <laughs> exactly. Funded yeah. an entire industry. And so yeah. along comes CrossFit and suddenly I'm doing, you know, 300 and some odd pound deadlifts at speed combined with other, and I seriously injure my back. That, you know, initially I was like, I've never had this. It's like awful feeling, as you know, like it's just yeah. horrible when you can't move. And, and so I was like, this is a severe limitation, but I know it's going to heal right? It's not like I broke my spinal cord. I just tore some muscles and whatnot. And my pelvic floor was not being supported and it was painful as hell. So because I was resilient and I had the mental tools, I looked at that as just a temporary obstacle. And so I devoted a lot of my mental energy toward healing. And then you know this at, from your fields, like when you devote mental energy in the form of, of positive dialogue and visualization, and you visualize yourself healing and you expect to heal fast, guess what? Your body will comply because it's all energy. So you contribute mental energy to the act of healing. And I heal very, very quickly from that injury and any injury, like probably three times as fast as anyone else. And secondarily, I look at it as a temporary thing, right? Most people think when something happens, it's like permanent, like, oh, I'm, this happened. This is who I am. Life sucks. Whereas a resilient individual will look at it and say, oh, life just happened again. Ha <laughs> ha. Look at that. And now I'm going to deal with this positively. So I'm going, to, I'm going to contribute the right energy toward whatever healing or getting through this challenge, whatever crisis it is. I'm going to maintain my positive mindset with positive internal dialogue and seeing myself in my whole state at the other end of this situation. And I'm also going to figure out how to continue to maintain and even accelerate my physical development in other ways working around the limitation, right? So I said, okay, given my back injury, I know I can't do a lot, a lot of things I love to do, but what can I do? Right. You look for the opportunity. Yeah. Find the opportunity, find the silver lining, right? So another example, doing a crazy CrossFit box jump one day, I kind of wasn't paying attention and I kicked the box out while I was trying to land on it and did, you know, like a two scream fall, yeah. smack my hand on the grinder at our old SEAL Fit Training Center and broke my wrist. That takes one of my appendages out of action, but it didn't take me out of action. So what do I do? I'm like, okay, so what, I can row still with one arm. I can do one arm pushups. I can do a lot of one arm kettlebell swings and I can do, there's a, a lot of one arm work I can do. And I can do a heck of a lot with my lower extremities and my core. Once my wrist is healed, I'll, I'll make up for the lost time on the other side. 
And it was a lot of fun and it actually changed things up, you know, so you can use injuries and setbacks to your advantage to work on things that you don't normally work on and to get out of the rut, so to speak. So that's another way that we can look at resilience. If you're enjoying this episode about building resilience, then you should check out the amazing masterclass library in the AIM 7 app. We've got world leading experts in performance psychology, including Dr. Peter Haberl, who is the senior sports psychologist for the US Olympics, teaching about things like psychological flexibility, mindfulness, and so much more. You can try AIM 7 for free for one week by using the link in the show notes. What are you doing from a daily mental training? Like, are there things that you're doing mentally every day to build this resiliency, this ability to consistently move forward? I mean, are yeah. there practices in your life that you're engaging in? Yeah, absolutely. And everybody has some practices, whether they know it or not. Like I have a saying that if you're not training your mind, then someone else is training it for you. And the results will speak for themselves. All of life is mental training. From the moment you open your eyes after exiting the moon, there's basically everything is conditioning and training of the mind. So when you wake up to this fact, then you can take responsibility for training your own mind. And that includes what you put into your mind, what you take to be truth. It includes a deep examination of what you've been trained and conditioned in the past to find out whether it's real or true or not, or whether it serves you or not. And then it takes, there's a lot of uh, deconstruction of all those concepts that we take to be true, to be able to touch into the vast potential that lies in, you could call it the quantum field or source field or universal consciousness, which is where everyone's true raw potential comes from. So every day I have a certain number of practices and I teach these in my Unbeatable Mind program, as you're aware, and, and I introduced them in that book, Unbeatable Mind. The practices are bracketed with two rituals, a morning ritual and evening ritual. And I like that term ritual because when something is a ritual, it's, it's kind of like a sacred, can't miss it feeling to it. Whereas a routine is, I could have a routine, it could be different every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my routine today is different than my routine tomorrow, but a ritual is the same. Mm -hmm. So my morning ritual the things that I do for my mind, it's interesting that the mind-body connection is so intimate that some of the things, a couple of the things seem like they're physical, like I'm, they're body things, but they're actually done with the purpose of improving the mind. So the first one is box breathing. So it's a practice I developed and started teaching the SEALs back in 2006. And it's just controlled breathing. You know, it's nothing that the yogis have been doing for thousands of years. And controlled breathing through your nose in a box pattern or square pattern. And I teach it, you know, the simplest is either a four by four by four or a five by five, because it's really basic. It's easy. It's not dangerous at all. There's, there's no contraindications. And so what's happening there is the physiology is well understood now. There's a lot of research coming in, but if you do a five by five by five by five, five count inhale, five count hold, five count exhale, five count hold, all through the nose. You're slowing your breathing down to three breaths per minute. When you train yourself to do this and you do it every single morning for several months or you know maybe a little longer, everyone's going to be different, then what you're doing is you're rewiring your automatic nervous system so that it, during the day when you're not thinking about your conscious breathing or you're not conscious about your breathing is probably a better way to say that you're naturally breathing six breaths per minute which would be five in and five out without the hold. Cause you're not going to hold, you're not going to do box breathing all throughout the day. That's like a seated kind of meditative practice. Mm -hmm. Six breaths per minute is the optimal periodicity for breathing leading to optimal health as well as clarity in the mind. So that breath pattern affects your HRV and it's going to affect your brain waves. And it's going to, um, when done and perfected, will lead to a deep state of calm, focused attention which is all really good for learning and obviously good for being able to control the arousal response when you get triggered from some sort of stress trigger. The breathing also has a physiological benefit of bleeding off any excess stress and reactivating a parasympathetic pathway, nervous system pathway that might have been atrophied. And, and again, we're hearing a lot more about people, and especially in the Western world, being kind of stuck in hyperarousal mm -hmm. because their parasympathetic the neuro, neuro pathway has been atrophied or kind of like stuck closed, like a railroad switch is closed. 
normally you would have a really free flowing activation between uh, neurotransmitters between sympathetic and parasympathetic, sympathetic, parasympathetic. But if a parasympathetic rest and digest is closed, atrophied, then you're just constantly being triggered into stress mode in the sympathetic nervous system. That becomes the new normal. And you manage that with caffeine and alcohol and exercise and anger and that type of stuff, anxiety. <laughs> manage it slash manifest it. So box breathing, uh, when done as a morning practice and even part of an evening practice, begins to re-regulate your nervous system. It opens up and reactivates that parasympathetic pathway and it leads to this really calm, alert state in the body. And of course, the body brain is part of the body. So that's where you start to get that kind of down regulation of the monkey mind and more clarity in your mind because you're now operating at that alpha, delta, high alpha, low beta state. I mean, there's so much more that happens with box breathing because we use it as a stacked practice. So I teach it in the sense of first, we're going to use box breathing to re-regulate the nervous system and to develop arousal control, control over that arousal response. Then because we're breathing in a controlled pattern, and I recommend 20 minutes in the morning when you wake up, and you're using it like a concentration practice, which is like Zen boot camp, right? When you start with Zen training, when I started with Zen training, it was concentration training, learning how to gather up your mental energy that is going out in all directions and default mode network. It's just bouncing through those loops of thinking. Now we gather all the energy up and we narrow our focus radically to just focusing on this box breathing pattern. So you pay attention to every little nuance of the inhale, of the hold, the exhale, of the hold. I even teach visualizing the box pattern being drawn in your mind while you're doing the four stages of it. And later on, I'll add a little power mantra, right? So every time you inhale and hold, you say the mantra. And, you know, I always teach my Navy SEAL one of feeling good, looking good out of me in Hollywood or Emil QA's day by day in every way, I'm getting better and better, that type of stuff. And so now you're turning the box breathing practice into concentration training and refining the energetic quality of your thoughts. Because, you know, if you're thinking and verbalizing internally really positive thoughts, then that vibrational quality, you know, lingers and, and it begins to charge your mind with that vibrational quality. And then over time, you're much less likely to ruminate on negative thinking and have negative internal dialogue because it has such a distinctly different vibrational quality to it that you notice it right away. That You're like, that doesn't feel good. I don't want to go there. And so you immediately interdict that. It sounds to me like you're synchronizing a thought pattern that you want to replicate during the day with a basic biological function. That's right. That's true. You're merging an automatic, you know, uh, physiological response with a psycho a positive psychological energy, which is a th what a thought is. And those two become harmonized so that they mutually support each other. I hope you enjoyed today's episode with Mark because we've got two more coming your way with him. And if you learned something new today, do me a favor, take a screenshot of the cover art and share it on whatever social media platform you're on, tag us and let us know what you learned in today's episode. Thanks again for listening. And I'll catch you on the next show.